intro. Is the key. Good evening and welcome to the Obelisk. Tonight's guest is Damien Dumar. He's the publisher of, I lost the page, publisher of The Last Harvest, A Secret History of Lucifera, Aliens, The Illuminati, and the Fate of Humanity by Lucian Mars. Damien, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Jerry. Oh, it's our pleasure. Hi, Damien. Hi, niece. <laughs> it's you again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone, we have now had our little back green room thing. And of course, Jerry and Damien share New York. New York. And yep. So we have these, we have New Yorkers in the house and everyone knows how I love the old school New Yorkers. New school New Yorkers are a whole different matter. That's true. Yeah. It is true. Woke, <laughs> New York woke is, bastards. <laughs> yeah. New York is not what it once was. No. Nope. So Damien how are things with you? And as I told you in the setup here, I have some questions from when you did a live stream over at the speakeasy for the cosmic salon. And we'll be getting into those. Those were all, those are RH negative based and vampire based, but in general, how are you doing? What's going on in your world? I'm doing very well. My world is pretty good. I don't have any complaints. Things are sailing along relatively smoothly. Of course, as the Grateful Dead once sang, once life looks like easy street, there's danger at your door. I think that was the lyric. I may have botched it, but <laughs> I always have that in the back of my mind, but I try to enjoy it when it's peaceful. Yes, indeed. And just so everyone knows, Jeff Rentz is having uh, Damien on every two weeks. He's absolutely fascinated. So Damien, you're going to be on Rentz's show tomorrow, right? Yes, I have a column on his webpage, though it's just recordings. Yeah, but it's just interesting that he's put you in the fold like this. Well, I, I I believe that it probably is because the material that's in The Last Harvest, all of it is material that has never been heard anywhere else. And it all makes sense and tends to uh, fill in all the missing pieces to certain questions that people have, most notably, what exactly is going on? They know there's something wrong. They can't quite put their finger on the pulse of it. And the last harvest tends to really answer those questions above and beyond. And, you know, because I've done some chats with you, I've had you on the cosmic salon, you've been in the speakeasy and uh, there's, it's a, I'm amazed at how triggering you are for people. I have gotten just absolutely wild responses and, um, about you and you're 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 really just the publisher of this book Correct. and 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 you're out there and my first show with you was actually who is damien dumar so i i suggest people listen to that because you give us a good background of who you are but you are here with this book and it's interesting that a lot of people are focusing on you when really the content is about the book and Lucy and Mars, if, if, it, if we're going to look at a person. Right. Well, I think that I, I would tend to agree that what's most important is what's in the book. And I usually tend to focus on the book, but obviously anyone who wrote a book like that, they're going to be questions about that person most notably would be, well, where did they get all this information? And then the other question would be directed towards me. Well, who are you and how did you get involved in this? And I think that one of the reasons that people 
will find me of interest is because since I am an RH negative and a alien human hybrid, I believe a lot of other people who are also in that position who are not fully conscious of how to what degree they are those those uh, things they are interested because they're looking at me to try to understand their own story. As far as other people go who've been triggered, all I can say is send me the most entertaining uh, <laughs> emails. I'd love to hear what people have to say. I don't get offended by anything. I, as a matter of fact, I expect that a lot of people will be triggered and say all sorts of uh, things that would be less than flattering, but that's fine. It's, it's totally okay with me. I expect it. And the main thing is that this information gets out there and not so much what people say about me. Yeah. Oh yeah. But you know, it's the full package. And I remember when I first listened to you, when I first discovered you, which was on Rance's show that first time, and he didn't realize you weren't Lucian. And so that was like that moment. And, and that was one of the things that I really wanted to make sure we did cover, like who is Damien Dumar, but let's get on with some of these questions I have. So sure. All right. So we'll knock these out and then we'll just go where we go from there. So she, Kathy says, asked one question here. She's got, um, could illness be like an implant to stop a hybrid or delay their ability? And then, so here's the caveat here or a side question to this first question, like severe illness, i.e. cancer, something deep like that. The answer is that, yes, it can be. I had a friend who was also in the Montauk project and he acquired in his later years, one of these mysterious degenerative type of diseases that slowly erodes the, the nervous system. And he was an individual who had displayed powers that were abnormal relative to what you would find inside of a human population. And he had, well, there were a lot of things that he demonstrated. So while I can't say for sure that the illness is meant to repress the individual because implants can do that job quite easily, oftentimes a side effect of what is done to one when one is undergoing the hybridization process or being conditioned for various purposes can have lasting effects that result in degenerative diseases for the simple reason that the body just can handle so much. The human form is actually very weak and limited, contrary to what people like to say about, oh, look how amazing what the human body can do. Yeah, sure, of course. But on a relative scale, it is not a strong body. It's not meant to survive or to thrive in, in most environments. So when they talk about the adaptability of the human, it's mostly a, a self-congratulatory fantasy. So I think also in the case of my own biological mother, who is passed maybe 10 years ago or so, she had been experimented on so much that eventually she developed Alzheimer's and cancer. Now, some people would listen to this and say, yeah, okay, you're, you're just looking for some way to uh, process something that was emotionally unacceptable to you. But nonetheless, this is my response to the question because I have seen it and it's not uncommon. All right, thank you. And let's go into number two. She says, what is the significance of blue baby in quotes, or the usual third baby born to a RH negative mother who then, okay, so the, I guess the second part of that is who then needs a total transfusion, blood transfusion, but lives, is the baby forever a vampire and, ha and, um, and haven't finished the book yet, but I am kind of getting, there are good and bad vampires, question mark. So those are her questions. Okay, uh, well, as far as what when she mentions blue baby, I'm not sure what that means. I haven't heard that term before. As far as the third, what she said something about the third born child in an RH negative family needs blood transfusions. I am, I am unsure about that information. I, I, I am not qualified to speak on that, but 
this idea somehow that that baby becomes a vampire because it receives a blood transfusion. I, I have never heard of that. And it, it doesn't make any sense to me on the surface. Some, if someone is vampiric or has vampiric traits latent or otherwise, those tend to be already present in the, in the DNA. How it gets there, one, one answer would be hybridization. There are other ways it could get there also. So let's let's look at let's pause here because I did get a lot of questions about vampire stuff from the shows we put out and uh, a lot of people get really fascinated with that as part sure. of this. So there's a whole bunch about vampires in the collective. You and I have talked about this, but I haven't put all those shows out. And so everyone wants to know about the drinking of the blood and the image of the vampire to the collective conscious. Can you break down what, what you mean? What kind of vampire are you? What is, what's all this mean, Damien? Well, I think you, you, you pointed out correctly that people have the tendency to get fascinated with the topic of vampires, partially because they see it in Hollywood so often, and it is a form of escapism for many people. When you go to these so-called vampire conventions and LARPing events, and you have individuals who are dressing up as vampires, it's mostly not much different than someone who dresses up as their favorite character from the Avengers and goes to Comic-Con. And all that stuff really has little to nothing to do with vampires and vampirism. This idea of vampirism in its simplest explanation is that it could be described as a being who exists on external energy sources and feeds on them. So for example, there are beings out there in the universe who would feed on radiation. And there is a, a couple in, in Russia, I saw a YouTube video on them. And for whatever reason, they live on radioactivity. And they got into a lot of trouble because they were going around acquiring all sorts of radioactive and nuclear materials. And the <laughs> Russian government thought that they were planning to build bombs or be terrorists. And then they explained, no, we need this. And we actively go into radioactive areas because this is what keeps us healthy. And they even had certain traits they showed on video, like when you turned out the lights, they glowed or something like this. And a lot of people would say, well, this is a joke, but I would say it's not. I would say that there are beings out there who live on radiation. And that in itself is a type of vampirism. The image of the vampire, as we know it today, actually comes from stories of the reptilian Siakar empire because they are certain classes or uh, I should say castes of reptilians, warrior caste and above, who they have fangs and, and they imbibe blood, much like other predators would. So that is where the original story of the vampire comes from. And the original story of the werewolf comes from the Sarayan based uh, wolf and Anunnaki empire. And the reason there's this conflict in modern science fiction in films like the Underworld saga between lichens or werewolves and vampires is actually a retelling of the story of the struggle between the wolf and Anunnaki and the reptilian Siakar empire. So all these legends that we commonly indulge ourselves in for entertainment, they come from real stories and real events in galactic history. So this idea that human beings could be drinking blood one first has to realize that the human body can only consume so much blood before it will vomit it up. The human body is not made to be drinking blood. So any individual who goes out there and drinks blood, they're for the most part playing at it because how much can you consume before you get sick? That isn't to say that there aren't people out there who do drink blood, but why they're doing it exactly, a lot of it may be mental illness or, or because there's some sort of genetic component where they're just lacking something that they, they get out of the blood. But that, as far as human beings running around biting people in the neck and drinking their blood and turning them to vampires, that is something that doesn't exist in the way that people think it does. And so when we're looking at, say, people that have gone through the, the transformation like you, what does that mean? Does this mean you're immortal in your flesh? How how does that work 
or people that have gone through it? Right. Well, we have to, in order to talk about that, we have to look at the this idea of immortality as a general concept, irrespective of vampires. And when you look at the human lifespan, the human lifespan is 100 years if you're lucky, and probably the last 30 years of that 100-year lifespan is going to be rather miserable, and you'll be praying for death. <laughs> so, uh, and this was done on purpose. It was the genetic re-engineer named Lucifer, who was an alpha draconian reptilian from the Siakar Empire. He engineered human beings to have these short lifespans to keep them under control, partially because the longer a being lives, the more wisdom it acquires, the more knowledge, and hence the more power, and they become more of a threat. So if a lifespan is kept very low on a human being, then the human being has a great difficulty amounting to much of anything, because by the time it learns anything, it's game over. And I'm sure that you've heard this from many human beings you've talked to who will say things like, oh, uh, by the time I figured it out, it was too late, or I wish it could go back when I, knowing what I know now and relive. Yeah, that's by design. <laughs> so now if we look at the lifespan of various extraterrestrials, you could say that a, uh, a Nebu Gray alien or extraterrestrial, they have a lifespan of around 20,000 years. So when a being lives for 20,000 years, how would they view a being that lives for only 100? It's almost as if that being doesn't even exist. The same way a human being would look at an insect that lives for two weeks in the summer and say, eh, whatever. So the other thing we have to factor in now, because we want to talk about this idea of immortality, is that when a lot of these beings reach the end of their life cycle, they simply transfer their consciousness and their soul into a new vehicle. So the technology that is in use or available to a lot of these extraterrestrial civilizations, whether it's the Nebu Gray, the reptilian Siakar Empire, the technology is about 100 million years ahead of ours. And people need to just pause for a second and wrap their mind around that. It's, it's something that's very hard for a lot of people to believe or to accept or even fathom. But that's how long a lot of these civilizations have been in existence. So they have long perfected the technology to transfer souls and consciousness. They're not sitting around debating, oh, is there a soul or not? They know it's there because they can transfer it from one vehicle to another. So as one would begin to approach the end of their life cycle, a new body is prepared for them and they're transferred into it. So in that respect, those beings who can do that are immortal. It's no different than what you see in that popular Netflix series, Altered Carbon, where human beings attain this ability to transfer their consciousness and attain a sort of immortality. So this Which idea was that, a technology they received from aliens. Exactly. Yes. So this is what, what in fact goes on. So this idea that someone is in a, in a, a physical immortal form where the biological flesh never ages for all eternity, uh, that, that <laughs> maybe somewhere in creation, I'm not an expert, I'm not the divine father, there are beings like this, but for the most part, to my knowledge, what I can say is that most of this is technological, although a lot of these beings do have incredibly long life cycles to begin with. Uh, for, if a being lived 20,000 years as a natural life cycle, to a human, that would appear to be immortal, even though it's not. Jerry, I didn't know if you were jumping in there. I, I have, I have, well, yeah, I have a question. You, you were talking about Lucifer being Anunnaki, or no, no, he was not Anunnaki. He was a reptilian. He was an Alpha Draconian reptilian from the Siakar Empire. Okay, okay. Right. Um, and when you mentioned that he engineered us, or that group did, it just made me think about the stories of Enki and Enlil, and I was wondering, well, hey, is there a relationship there? Sure, Enki is another named for Lucifer. Okay. And Enlil was the prince and the warlord of the uh, Wolf and Anunnaki Empire. So technically speaking, I, I say Wolf and Anunnaki as one unit, mm -hmm. but if I was going to be precise about it, the Anunnaki are actually creations of the Wolfen. So the Wolfen genetically engineered the Anunnaki, but the two are often referred to 
together for that reason, because the name Anunnaki actually comes from King Anu, who was Enlil's father. So the idea was that it was Anu's creations. Okay. And they also did a lot of genetic engineering on this planet. Mm -hmm. So the creations on this planet, for the most part, were engineered either by Enki or Enlil. And the two of them hated each other, and even though they were forced to be together as a matter of convenience because they were being threatened by a third empire known as the Magians. And the Magians are the oldest race in creation, or I should say species. I don't know what the proper word was, but as far as extraterrestrials go, they are the oldest and they are the ultimate vampiric beings. So while the Siakar reptilian empire is known for vampires and the vampire legends involving blood come from this vision of, of warrior class reptilians who drink blood, the Magians are actually vampires on a, a very high level where they would just draw the life out of somebody in, in combat on a battlefield and could kill them in that way. So luckily for the rest of the universe, their population is somewhat limited and they're not that interested in a lot of things that other extraterrestrial groups would be interested in. But so this idea of vampirism, it's it's not limited to just the reptilian Siakar empire. And there are other entities in the universe in many different forms that are technically vampiric. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I, I definitely see the underworld parallel, the underworld show movies parallel yes. there. Mm -hmm. The wolf in and the vampire. Correct. It's and like, they cover the idea of hybridizing the two. <laughs> and what is the outcome when you hybridize these two species? Powerful and being. Yeah. Right. It's quite accurate. Yeah. But the, uh, also made me think of uh, that movie, Jupiter Ascending. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the, got a wolf in there. You got the vampiric aliens. Yeah, interesting. I, I, it just, yeah, I'll shut up. Go ahead, Nish. <laughs> well, well I, I would just like to interject sure. that a lot of individuals who write these science fiction scripts, they, some of them are members of certain secret societies. It's just not well known that they are. So they have access to a certain amount of information that they're drawing from. And others are just naturally capable of tapping into what I could loosely define as a collective unconscious and pull this information out and it ends up in, in films. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the pop culture of it. The, uh, how much control does Lucifera or um, your sect here have with how this is played out through literature and folklore, folk horror and pop culture? Is there a tie in here? Well, the the extraterrestrial groups that seize control of the planet when they rebelled against the Siakar Empire, which is loosely could be defined as the Anunnaki and the Nebu Gray, who got together along with uh, several reptilians who rebelled. So they basically took the planet for themselves and they took it upon themselves to begin to rewrite history in a way that favored them. I, I, as I've pointed out in, in the past, the reptilian Siakar empire is matriarchal in nature. It's completely dominated by females. Uh, some people would say, well, why is that so? Is that a cultural? thing. No, it's a biological thing. In human civilization on this planet, men dominate the females because they're physically stronger. But in the reptilian Siakar empire, the reptilian females who are warrior caste and above, they have the advantage that they are envenomed like a cobra. So they can spit venom, they can bite you, they can just get some of it on you, and it's game over. So this gives them an incredible advantage on a biological level. So that is one of the reasons that females dominate that civilization. In terms of the Anunnaki and the Wolfen Empire, they are extremely patriarchal and they view females as good for nothing but breeding. So as you can probably imagine, there is a huge conflict between these two. I wouldn't even say cultures because in the case of the the reptilian Siakar empire, it's a biological fact. So in human civilization, if you looked at India, they have a caste system. But if you ask yourself, 
what is the difference between a Brahmin and an untouchable? Nothing. It's a name only. But if you went to the Siakar Empire, you could clearly see that a warrior caste is different from a drone caste, which is different from an Alpha Draconian royal caste, because biologically they're so different. Sort of like for those who are fans of the science fiction series Aliens, you'll notice that throughout the movies there are different casts of aliens, and they have very different biological factors to them. So this is uh, what goes on between these two civilizations. So naturally, when the patriarchal Anunnaki took over, they did everything they could to delete Lucifer from the consciousness of people. So they will say they built the pyramids when in fact Lucifer did. So um, this is how it ended up the way it is. In terms of how much control does the Siakar have with respect to the narrative on this planet? Well, I think the best example would be the film Star Wars. And George Lucas was someone who actually knew something. Uh, the yes. idea of the idea of the Death Star, for example, is an actual creation of the reptilian Siakar Empire. So when they refer to the eye in the sky and in mythology, that was a Death Star. And that it did actually exist. There were many of them. And they could, in fact, wipe out planets. And this was, was used as a matter of course. So the thing with Star Wars is, of course, it it tells actually the story of the Anunnaki and the Nebu Gray rebelling against the Siakar Empire. So it's telling humans a story, but they're basically taking their own rebellion story and twisting it up. So in the Star Wars films, you have this idea of the rebels and, and they just want freedom. And then you have the, the, uh, the, the, the empire itself oh the empire and it all has death stars and 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 they're all uh, oppressing everybody so this actually is sort of the the narrative of the anunnaki they are the ones who consider themselves the rebels but they couldn't put in the film that they were aliens so they make it all in in terms of humans that this is all oh, this is a story about the struggle between humans but it's actually the story of the anunnaki rebelling against the Siakar from their frame of reference. So from the point of view of the Siakar, you're all a bunch of traitors. You betrayed us and you went off and created a lot of problems, et cetera, to put it lightly. And from their point of view, they want to tell the story as if they're somehow heroes for being traitors. When from the Siakar point of view, there's nothing heroic about being a traitor, but they can tell the story however they want because they're in control of the narrative, narrative on this planet. How much George Lucas knew about this, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that George Lucas was a member of certain societies and did have access to a certain amount of information. So again, it's when you, whenever you see a, a science fiction series that have that much traction, one has to carefully look and say, okay, well, what story are they actually telling here? How many are here now? With respect to uh, the vampires that are specifically here, is there so? Okay, so as we ease into the the last harvest, I want to get a feel for um, how many are walking amongst humans right now of different species or races, and let's start with vampires. Well, I haven't conducted a census, so I, I, I would I say, know that, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I will speak in terms of generalities. First of all, as far as vampires go, again, we, we have this whole issue of what do you define a, as a vampire? So I will avoid that for now. And I will say in terms of how many Nebu Gray are on this planet, not that many. The Nebu Gray Empire is vast and huge in the in the, the galaxy. Uh, but as far as the number of Nebu Gray that are actually on the planet, it's it's not that many. And in terms of reptilians, it's even less. So this is one of the reasons that the powers that be 
extraterrestrially speaking, are always very nervous about the ever-growing human population and seeking to curtail it in general. And they're always have a big vested interest in keeping people as clueless as possible. And the book, The Last Harvest, goes into great detail about how this was pulled off, how human beings were engineered over and over to keep be kept under control, how the trap of being reincarnated over and over onto this planet was set up, the technologies that are were used to keep people's minds in the basement, so to speak. So th the reason why there was a lot of focus put on this is because there was always this fear in the back of the minds of those who were in control of this planet. And that fear was, well, what would happen if, if human beings were to wake up and, and do something and say, we're not going to put up with this anymore? It would be an issue because of the sheer numbers. Unfortunately for human beings, they never did anything with their free will that would be in that direction. So at this point, it's, it's sort of too late. And just to, to just the last thing I think on the vampire stuff is, so there's, there's some different images through folklore and then through modern, uh, the modern telling of the narrative. But I think the vampire and Nosferatu, uh, this type of vampire that seems to be more, uh, tied into some old school folklore, especially through the Eastern Bloc in Europe and up into the Western parts of Europe and into Siberia and all this. Um, of course, the Carpathians. This is the imagery we have from folkloric drawings, from oral tradition of them. And then, of course, down to the... Uh, the first movie, I think it was Fritz Lang. And then, of course, the brilliant, one of my favorite all-time favorite movies from Klaus that Klaus Kinski played in um, is a different type of image. It's a more almost, if I can say this, more bug-like type of uh, being and looks way less human than, say, when we start to get into the Victorian period when we're looking at Bram Stoker. So, again, these are different images of what the archetype, what the general arc of a vampire is. Do you, what can you say to this as far as how that broke down in imagery? And was there anything with that earlier image I gave to you with say the Nosferatu type that might have more truth in it? Yeah, I think the, if you wanted to go very far back in, in human history, in terms of historical uh, primary sources that we can access because there is actually human history that predates far predates what would be found in current writings. But if we looked at current writings that were available today and we looked at the works of Homer, when he wrote stories like the Iliad and about the fall of Troy and all that, he, he often would make references to, a type of beings that he called the Keres, who would be spelled K-E-R-E-S. And you'll see this idea also in the Valkyrie, and a very much watered down version in Norse mythology. So the way he described the Keres is that he said that when the warriors of old times would be fighting on the battle and slaughtering each other, that the Keres would descend from the heavens to feed upon the dying soldiers and they would fight over the bodies of the dying and, and this sort of thing. And so people tend to look at that as a fantasy story, like Greek mythology, the idea of harpies or minotaurs. And one must understand that these ideas of minotaurs and harpies, it harkens back to a time when the Anunnaki we're going hybridization crazy and making all sorts of beings that they probably shouldn't have made just because they could. They were engineering creations with no thought, no wisdom, no forethought about what would happen to these creatures. And so a lot of these mythological creatures did in fact at one time 
walk the planet. So the Kerries are actually a, a type of extraterrestrial and they're vampiric. And so when they descended from the heavens, what actually happened in those old times was they'd be a battlefield and these extraterrestrials who would watch it would say, oh, good, it's dinner time. And they would come down from the spacecraft and descend upon the battlefield and have at it with the, with the dying. So people at that time could see them because reality was a little bit different for lack of a better way to express this. And human beings at that time were also different because they hadn't under, undergone yet some of the further engineering that would make them the livestock they are today. So people were well aware of the existence of these beings, but now from our current perspective, we look back on it and say, well, Homer was just smoking some Greek weed or whatever and, and made this stuff up. And it sounds really good. It looks good in a Ray Harryhausen film from the 1950s uh, or whatever, but uh, no, they, they actually, these beings did exist. So when Jason and the Argonauts, and he talks about there was a siren that was luring ships to their destruction, beings like this existed at, those, at that time. And they were more easily accessible to the experience of what you would define as human beings then. So I think that since that time, these legend, legends have just continued to to spiral out of control. I'm sure you've heard the story of, well, if you tell a secret to some person, they tell it to the next person. And every time they tell it, something's different. And by the time the 10th person has been told, the story is completely different. And I think that a lot of this is the case with vampire mythology, where nowadays we have a, a story which doesn't look at all like what the original source was, but it surely sold a lot of movie tickets and sold a lot of novels. Yes, it certainly has. It, it there's a reason why it, it it's primordial in the collective. They know something's there. So, yes. and I guess one more thing to iron this out, and I, I don't know why I wasn't thinking about it, but the whole psi vampire thing and the, the psychic vampire thing, and this is a this is tricky water because everyone knows those people that come into a room and they just drain it, and everyone's got like uh, been around that person at work that's just like, oh man, you know, you feel worse than when you left and that's kind of colloquially known as a psi vampire, even though they may be a God fearing Christian who knows, but then there are actual people who claim to be psychic vampires or psi vampires that feed on the life force of, of humans. So can you give us some clarity here? Well, I think the term energy vampire is often loosely used and popular uh, psychology to describe people who have cluster B personality disorders. So if someone has narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder, they, they tend to drain people around them, but it's mostly through the drama that they create. So then these individuals are often referred to in slang as psychic vampires, but that's not exactly what a psychic vampire is, even if people are in fact being drained out. If one has a stressful job, the job will drain you out too with all the drama and stress. But would you say that your job is a vampire? Mm, you could say that as a metaphorical statement, but it wouldn't actually be the case. But as far as this idea of psychic vampirism, well, it doesn't come from nowhere because psychic energy is a form of energy. And just like the people who feed on radioactivity, they are beings out there in creation that will feed on psychic energy, everyone has heard stories of succubi and incubi feeding on sexual energy. Uh, so that even Asian folklore is filled with tales of shape-shifting foxes that shape-shift into beautiful women and have sex with men and take their life force and that sort of thing. So the Koreans too. 
Right, Koreans have it as well. Yeah. So they'll call them Kitsuni or yep. Fox yep. Fox Spirits. And, yep. And Chinese they say Huli Huli Wang or something like that. So it's these these cultures are replete with this sort of legends. So they don't come from nowhere. I could just leave it at that. Jer, what do you have on here? I have many things. <laughs> Let it lay it out, baby. But I didn't want to get ahead of the story. Uh, uh, I, where did all these beings go? Well, that's a good question. Who's to say that they aren't still here in some way, shape, or form? I think that to look at these questions, one has to look at the idea that the universe has many dimensions to it. And even within dimensions, you have sub-dimensions. So as the book, The Last Harvest points out, they are sub-dimensions on this planet, which contain not only various extraterrestrials, but also places that we would describe as hell. So while there are many hells in creation, the hell that people are normally referring to is actually a sub-dimensional space inside the planet so one can't necessarily get to that just by saying hey i'm going to walk over there but just like you would tune different frequencies on a radio dial it doesn't mean that they don't exist so you can apply this idea to ghosts as well some people can see ghosts others can't so are they there are they not well science what we put in quotes cannot necessarily prove whether there is a ghost or there isn't but anyone who can legitimately see ghosts or interact with them, they don't have any doubt in their mind that they exist. Of course, the people that they would tell this to would have doubts about that person's sanity, perhaps, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, could, they couldn't see it. Right. But that doesn't mean it's not there. So a lot of these extraterrestrials, they inhabit multiple dimensions. So... In many respects, the human mind is, is inherently limited by design to be unable to detect all these different frequencies of reality because it keeps them dumb and enslaved. Yeah, that, that reminded me of, um, have, have you ever heard of Radu Sinemar? The name sounds vaguely familiar. So he writes about... Um not hollow earth but an underground civilization and has written about and you can reach these by going through a series of caves where you have to tune your frequency and get into that space in order to get to their dimension quote-unquote dimension so yeah no well, I, I i'm all about the extra dimensional stuff that's <laughs> yeah, all planets are hollow the earth is no exception yeah and some people wonder, well, why was there a treaty signed by all the countries on Earth to not go into Antarctica anymore? Of and course. part of the reason is that those who live in the hollow Earth don't want humans anywhere near that. Nobody likes humans. Yeah, we're kind of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what way to put it? <laughs> what else, Jared? It seemed like you had some stuff. I'm the rest of my questions can wait because I, I want to know more about the book since I haven't read it yet. Okay. And, and, and well, you, this you is... jumped into like questions that, that I think, yeah. you know, 80% of audience are like, what the hell's going on? We, I missed half I... the show. <laughs> yeah. There is a kind of assumption that a lot of people who have listened to the show are, or who are going to be listening to the show are huge fans of niche and have heard a lot of this background before. So they're, they already have a running start, but that doesn't account for the many listeners who probably have tuned in and said, what are they talking about? <laughs> yes. So I think th this is probably a good time to talk about the book because yes, that's, so... that's really what's important. Everything else we're talking about is really entertainment. And why I, I totally understand that people want to hear about this because once they find a source of information like the last harvest that answers so many questions, it naturally breeds a million more questions. Mm -hmm. And that's why all the people, 
the questions I've had from people that have listened to the shows we've done, Damien. So, yeah. So why don't you give us, let's, let's talk about the book and let's talk about the message of the book and then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, those who, I know Nisha's read the book, but Jerry has not, but he has ordered it. And anyone who would like a copy of the book can easily get it on Amazon. And if they are very busy, they have an audiobook available and I picked the narrator myself and he is absolutely incredible. And he doesn't read an abridged version of the book. He reads everything word for word. So if that, it, with that being said, it's 14 um, hours long and it's free if you sign up for Kindle or that's Audible, correct. Audible, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's available. The audiobook is available on every platform in existence. Well, on, a, on this planet, in existence on this planet, let me point that out. It might be on some platforms because I'm sh outside this planet because I'm sure the Nebu Gray is reading about what's in this book because they're not totally thrilled with everything that's presented in it themselves. So the question is, well, what's The Last Harvest by Lucy and Mars really about? And if you look at the cover, you'll see it's got a picture of the Georgia Guidestones. And they've been in the news lately because people try to blow them up. So what's the big deal about the Georgia Guidestones? Well, the Georgia Guidestones, in essence, de describe a plan to reduce the population of the planet from around 8 billion down to 500 million. And they're not going to do this by passing out birth control pills, but rather through genocide. So there's a lot of mystery around the Georgia Guidestones. Who created them? Who paid for them? who obtained the land to put them on. So for those of you who are interested in all that sort of thing, the book, The Last Harvest goes into great detail about the background of the Georgia Guidestones, who commissioned them, who carved them, who set them up, how the land was purchased. All these sorts of questions are answered just for those who are into those little details. And I bring that up because some people have asked me about that. This is very fascinating for them. So the book, The Last Harvest goes into great detail about this plan to depopulate the planet down to 500 million or less, as well as it goes into the time frame of 2025 being the year when this plan is scheduled to commence because the elite are not comfortable with doing such wonderful activities as starting World War III, for example, until they have completely finished all of their underground bunkers and cities and they're totally ready to be snug as a bug in their estimation and hide down there for as long as possible while the rest of the planet goes into turmoil. So while the first part of the book, The Last Harvest, can be dismissed as many by many people as speculative in nature, since after all, we're talking about who created human beings and the, the exopolitics of the galactic history of this galaxy, the latter half of the book is not material that can be dismissed as speculative unless one really wants to put one's head in the sand because the words in the latter part of The Last Harvest are not Lucy and Mars words, but they're actually the words of the elite themselves. We're talking Henry Kissinger, the Rockefellers, Bill Gates, Obama, Ted Turner, Cousteau, Angela Merkel even. It goes on and on and on. And what we see over and over in the elite's own words, in their official government reports, in their speeches, is this idea of bringing the population down to the 500 million level and beginning this plan in the year of 2025. So I believe that human beings would be inclined to show an interest in a plan that is set to commence in two years from now, or even less than that, it's probably one and a half years. And I'm sure they'd be very interested in the plan that involves nine out of 10 of their family members being put down. So of course, some people may listen to this and say, well, I'm gonna be the, in the one out of 10 that survived because I have a bug out bag and an AR-15 and a lot of food stockpiled. But for those people who think that, I would point out that Another issue that The Last Harvest covers in great detail is the construction of FEMA camps in the United States. 
And at this point, there are enough FEMA camps, and let's just call, we'll call them what they are, concentration camps, in North America, both above and below the ground, that they're capable of housing, in quotes, 30 million people. So should you survive the nuclear wars that are on the horizon? Should you survive the viral warfare attacks? Should you survive the weather changes? Chances are that you will find yourself inside one of these FEMA camps. And needless to say, you won't have a PlayStation in there. And if you have a family, your wife and children will be separated from you. And we all know how well women and children fare in the new world order, because we can see what the elites do with trafficked women and children nowadays. So imagine what will happen in the future when the FEMA camps are in full effect. So while people have not been able to prove the full extent of the FEMA camp network, nobody can deny the existence of FEMA camps. Even FEMA itself does not deny their existence. So the last harvest goes into great detail about the background of FEMA camps, how they were created, how they plan to use them. And some people would maybe perk up at this point and say, okay, well, how did Lucy and Mars find out about that? Well, there's actually a book on Amazon you could buy. It's a military field manual. And in that military field manual, they go into great detail exactly how they plan to operate these camps, including a staff of PSYOPs specialists on there. Now, why would you need PSYOPs specialists inside of a FEMA camp? Well, the other question is, if FEMA camps were for housing people in the event of a disaster, why would you need to surround them in barbed wire and gun towers? Why would you put them in the middle of nowhere? Why would you have railway lines going out into the middle of nowhere just to deliver people to these camps. So if anything, the last harvest, again, creates more questions than ever before. When one reads it, they don't, people don't just have questions about aliens and vampires. They also have questions about these FEMA camps. And to be honest with you, that's really what they should be asking about because uh, vampires and extraterrestrials are really kind of far removed from people's everyday life experience, at least most people's, but being in a FEMA camp is not something that's going to be far removed from them. Uh, neither are calamities such as nuclear war. Even the city of New York recently was running ad campaigns, public service announcements, we could call them to be precise, telling people what they should do in the event of a nuclear attack. And one views these public service announcements. And I think that the question that a lot of people may ask themselves is, does the government know something that we don't know? Yeah, well, Damien, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Exactly. And I, you know, this is one of the things that uh, is, is definitely out there for people to see it's in it's in other documents as well deborah tavares is at stopthecrime.net has certainly covered a lot of that material as well in an excellent way in which she always does and uh these there there have been videos released with high-ranking intel with high-ranking intel from high-ranking military officials but not just in america and other places through with other languages. So this, this narrative is out there. And I think most people understand that we are moving into what is looking very totalitarian and the extent of it, which is what this book brings in is a very dark extent. So it takes away. Um, so I think the thing I appreciate about this book, which is, uh, is that it's just straight from the hip. You know, it's basically a call to get right with whatever you are getting right with. You know, if you're getting get right with all father, you know, or the all mother, whatever, whatever it is, because there's a lot coming down the line. Now, we all know that. But the thing about the that separates this also is 
the timeline is right here, Damien. And as I've talked to you, uh, the, the Masonic stuff is also talking about, and I don't know how public it's gotten, but I've known about it for years and years, um, 2025, 20, 26, that range of some big stuff going down. And the, so the timeline's not 20 years off. The timeline's now. And this is the thing that the, the more evidence that comes in, the more people talking about it, the more it, the receipts seem to suggest this really is. So what moved me about this book, I think in the end, the most was the timeline. And I don't think when you're presenting something to people that are thinking they're going to, they've got 20 years to get ready or anything. And now they're looking at a year and a half before all these dominoes start falling. It's crushing. And that's a lot of information I get back from people is how crushing it is. But for me, it's, well, if you got cancer today and it was just a systemic, terrible cancer, like bone cancer, or, you know, I don't know, something in the endocrine system is just going to wipe you out real fast you are going to transition and you need to be prepared for that transition. This book is kind of doing that. And in doing that, it's kind of giving, every, it's kind of doing a favor, Damien, just to get people into a mindset that everyone knows bullshit going on. Everyone knows that things are looking more totalitarian Marxist through our governments, through the overreach, through the total control grid. And now we have this that is tied into the Georgia Guidestones. So this, I think, ultimately is kind of like a wake up call. Uh, that's how I see it, Damien. Yes, it, it is a wake up call. It's actually a, a type of prejudgment from the Divine Father and the Divine Father is, is the, the one who wanted this book written, and he wanted it written because, well, he wanted human beings to know the story about what is going on and where they came from and what the history is that has led up to this, the last harvest. And as people will say, well, what's the call to action? This book is so dark. Yes, it, the book is incredibly dark. You are, the book is saying that you are going to die by 2050, the latest, there will be nobody on this planet. There probably won't even be a planet anymore. And if you believed in things like reincarnation, uh, you won't be reincarnating back onto this planet because there'll be no planet to reincarnate back on. Because a lot of people say, well, I'll just come back here, but no, it's, it's you're going to be gone. So this is naturally this doesn't sit well with with human beings who for the most part are very attached to to the to the idea of life uh here so i think that the, the takeaway from this book is that one has to acknowledge the divine father and reach out to him free from the confines of religion because as the book the last harvest points out all the three abrahamic religions were creations of the anunnaki for the purpose of division and uh fostering warfare even the, the, the figure of Yahweh that is often referred to in Abrahamic religions, Yahweh is just another name for Enlil, who liked to impersonate the Divine Father and pretend he was a god. And from the perspective of the human beings on this planet, he did appear to be one because he's up there in a spacecraft in the heavens and has all this advanced technology. So he would, he called himself Yahweh. So, uh, this is something that people have to keep in mind that if they there's nothing that can stop them should they want to from reaching out to their creator directly and to ask how they can align themselves with his will going forward and ask for feedback uh, in terms of where they they best belong in his creation in alignment with what his will would be and the rest is is pretty much uh up to the will of the father because it's it's not like we're at a point where things could be changed and one of the reasons that we're at this point that the last harvest points out is 
that beyond this idea of, of the Nebu Gray aliens desiring to reduce the population by 90%, there's this other vector of artificial intelligence, which human beings are constantly being encouraged to promote. So artificial intelligence eventually will get to a point where artificial intelligence will decide that human beings are no longer desirable on this planet. And as a matter of fact, while we're at it, I think the whole planet should be regentrified in accordance with what our idea would be. And this would be fine and dandy if it only was kept to this planet. But as soon as AI would be done renovating this place, it's going to go into space and attempt to do the same thing with every other planet in the universe. And other extraterrestrial groups will never stand for this. And the Divine Father certainly would never stand for it because it's an affront to his creation. And human beings, for the, just like they are influenced to go to war and to do things that are not in their best interest, human beings are also influenced to engineer an AI of this sort. And unfortunately, human beings, they have this, this greed and this, this desire to uh, have the latest technology with respect to one country having advantage over another. And this uh, creates a situation where AI will continue to be developed without any sort of wisdom, without any sort of restraint. And human beings in that sense seal their fate. And the extraterrestrials who promote AI and influence human beings to move in this direction, they as usual don't care at all about human beings and just use them for their own ends. So human beings, uh, to some degree, are, are not entirely at fault for what goes on, because as the last harvest points out, they were engineered by Lucifer to be controlled. And there were very specific steps that were taken to create a backdoor in the psyche of human beings. It's what psychologists would, or psychiatrists would call the unconscious mind and other extraterrestrial beings do not have an unconscious mind only the human being has an unconscious mind and even someone who has a cursory understanding of psychiatry or psychology will tell you the epic problems that are created by the unconscious mind because it's unconscious you don't have access to it yet it is dictating directions that you would be moving in life and that unconscious mind was created by Lucifer as the back door to which people could be controlled, they could be possessed very easily, and this is being used against humans. But while human beings have this against them, they still do have free will despite that. And while extraterrestrial forces can influence human beings to go to war, the human being still has the free will. Do I go to war or don't I? And so many human beings continuously choose to go to war. They don't have to, but they do. And there are consequences for the use or lack of use of your free will. So in, in many respects, human beings are in the predicament they're in now because of this. So you can't say it's entirely human beings' fault, but human beings are still responsible for what it is that they are responsible for because they have free will, because we live in a creation and not a clockwork. The divine father is not a watchmaker. He's a creator. So his creations have free will and what they do with it has consequences. And the last harvest is sort of pointing out the impending consequences only of human actions, but the actions of the extraterrestrials who are on this planet making problems in their own way. So, it's not entirely hopeless. There is, there is also this idea, well, why is the book called The Last Harvest? Well, one of the reasons it's called The Last Harvest is because there are extraterrestrial civilizations out there who are looking at human beings who are hybridized and saying, okay, which one of these beings are valuable? Which one of them can we integrate into our society? And they're looking to pull these individuals out before the the hammer falls. So for those individuals who are RH negative uh, and with respect to their blood and who have been hybridized and people who are RH negative are 10 to 15% of the population and many of those individuals are hybridized. For them, it's also a chance to try and uh, figure out where they belong. And that's a, sub a subject of conversation they can have with the divine father as well. So some individuals are, are, 
uh, inclined towards the light, so they could perhaps go with the Galactic Federation. Others are inclined towards the dark, and so they could go with the reptilian Siakar Empire. And there's no right or wrong necessarily, because as the it states in the King James version of the Bible, the Father creates both light and dark to suit his purposes for the for the goal of balance. So it's not so much a question of one is light or dark. It's is your will aligned with that of the divine father? That's really the more important question. And that would apply to people who are on the light side as well. Some people are on the, the side of light, but their will is not in alignment necessarily with that of the, the divine father at times. <laughs> I've had the craziest MP3s or um not EVPs with your your material too. Unbelievable, Jamie. All right, I think we're back. Can you confirm that with people, Jer? Guys, can you hear us? Of course, there's like a 15, hello. Fifteen second delay. No, you should not need to refresh, Sheila. Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay, we're back. I apologize, everyone. That was my fault. Sort of. So, Damien, do you remember? It was like a minute. You were still talking. Do you remember? And I'm sorry where you for were? interrupting. I, I do not remember where I was. Uh, <laughs> I was. So, so. I want to jump in here and make a. A comment because I forgot that I, I, I get this comment when I've talked about the FEMA stuff and I actually have friends that work for FEMA up high and I will tell you, they are not calling them FEMA camps and the FEMA camps are, you know, you can find them because people have on open source stuff called them that, and you can find them if you search, but they're they're going to be called different things, but FEMA is the organization behind them. And sure enough, there are, of course, people are going to be filtered into them, be, just like when there's an emergency, right? And there's a out here where I live in the ring of fire, if there's some sort of, you know, volcanism or something, you know, they always have place, safe places to go. And if it's big enough, then it's going to be something like that. But sure enough, they are intended to inter people. Uh, and so, again, there's really good information on all this stuff at stopthecrime.net. And Deborah Tavares won't talk with me. So let me tell you, I'm not pushing Deborah Tavares' stuff because there's an affiliation here. She's just really that good, has been that good of a journalist, uh, digging into this stuff. So there's plenty of excellent information on what FEMA is planning to do. There's plenty of government, actual government papers and real stuff out there. It is not a theory. It may be a conspiracy, but it's not a theory. These are plans of action that are actually already in motion because well, national emergency realness. So I'm going to leave it at that. And so as we look further, we're getting into the juice of the book now. And Damien, you were just talking about, you, you were laying out some of these ideas that that are here and why we should be more concerned with what's coming rather than who's doing what as far as vampires and wolves and all that stuff that I think sometimes discredits the larger message here, Damien. Have you had a kickback on it? Because if you want to, um, and then, you know, when you say things like, and we've talked about this, Galactic Federation, this is, this is knee-jerk territory. This is trigger territory for a lot of people that don't, feel that that has any validity in the end because of people like um i'm not gonna say but the you right. know who i'm talking about blue yeah. chickens blue space chickens and all that. uh this has i think been some of the biggest i I think and from this is the hardest stuff for a lot of people to swallow. And I myself, and I've told you when I hear that I have trouble with that as well. So 
what can you say about all that to kind of, I guess, ground this down into a reality people can can understand? Well, I think before I go into issues of about the Galactic Federation, let me just drop this one quote. So in 2005, January 14th specifically, the U.S. Army published a rapid action revision plan called Army Regulation 210-35, which is commonly known as the Civilian Inmate Labor Program, or more commonly as a concentration labor camp. So Army Chief of Staff General Peter J. Schumacher stated at the time, quote, this regulation provides guidance for establishing and managing civilian inmate labor programs on Army installations, end quote. Note the wording that this is not a prison labor program, but a civilian one. So if this sounds like the echo of Nazi Germany, perhaps there's a reason to suspect their motives. After all, with brainwashing specialist barbed wire, special POW numbers assigned. What else are we to believe? And what's so crazy about all this, what should really get people up in arms, not literally, because I don't want to be pulled into a camp yet, um, is this fact that it's their tax dollars that are being used to pay for all this. So there's this meme that's going about on the internet. Uh, you will see it a lot of times on 4chan and they're politically incorrect discussion forum where they'd say that, well, here you are on this planet paying taxes to pedophiles. And there's something to that, which is this idea that all of these horrors, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's the pedophile obsessed elite, whether it's the endless concentration camps that are being built, you're all paying for it. So Everyone knows how much they're taxed. They're taxed all the time, left and right, taxes, 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 taxes. And what happens to all this money? It's certainly not being used to improve your infrastructure or the quality of life. No, it's being funneled off into black projects, building, building FEMA camps, playing with retrofitted junk alien technology. None of it is in your best interest. So the idea that you're paying for your own death and enslavement should really get people upset. So far, it doesn't seem to, but it should. Look, no one likes paying taxes. Just realize what your taxes are being used to pay for. War. It's thug. It's thuggery. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's straight up extortion and thuggery. Taxation is theft. Yeah. Right. Abs what was the United States founded on? Rebelling against this idea of okay. taxation without representation. Yep. And, and, and now look at the United States today. What, what is this nonsense? You're being taxed more than ever, and it's not to pay for tea, it's to pay for your own demise and enslavement. Yep. And you don't think the elite think this is very funny? Of course they do. They say, look at these fools. They're paying for their own slaughter. Have you seen that meme of the, the, uh, the bankers like bent over laughing and then we told them it was for their own good that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> right and, and that's what's going on and, and the book the last harvest goes into massive detail about fema massive detail and not speculation again not lucian's words or conjecture no all footnoted credited quoted attributed source material it's not being pulled out of the ether it is no. very real stuff. So, yes, and um, you, you asked me earlier, you said, do you think that all these references to the Galactic Federation and shape-shifting reptiles discredits the work? You might fear that it would, but it doesn't because the stuff that's in the book, which is irrefutable and concrete, is so in your face that then you can't help but say, listen, if Lucy and Mars put together this level of research of such concrete material that is a direct threat to us, you think that at, in the same breath, he was schizophrenic and he also daydreamed about reptiles and aliens. The, the two, uh, it would be cognitively dissonant. So what most people think is they, they say to themselves, well, okay, if all of this information here that is immediately affecting me is so well put together then chances are a lot of this other material that would be dismissible by some people as speculative isn't really so speculative because you can't have these 
two sort of um, ideas existing at once, this idea of a very tangible, irrefutable reality, and then this speculative, dismissible reality. It just doesn't work. So I think a lot of people, they actually respond very well to the what you call the alien and UFO material in the book, especially because most people already do believe in UFOs and aliens. Even when I was a child and I went to the Hayden Planetarium in New York City during the star show, they would always say, and of course we are the only form of life in, in existence and all these other planets have no life. But if you went to the space show today, narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, I believe, or even if you went 10 years ago, they would say during the, the, the planetarium show, and of course, we're not the only form of life in the universe. How could you think otherwise because of X, Y, and Z? So they are already prepping for it and preparing for the inevitable. And so I believe that most people who grew up on the X-Files, they believe to one degree or another in UFOs and that information. But I think that a lot of the information that's out there, we won't name any names, is ridiculous. The way they describe the Galactic Federation as a bunch of, of surfer boys running around wearing tights, abducting you, uh, human beings to take them on romantic excursions throughout the galaxy. <laughs> this is not what the Galactic Federation is about. The Galactic Federation is, in fact, a federation of planets and civilizations, and they are humanoid. You would identify them visually as saying, well, a lot of them look like humans, though a lot of them aren't. The, and they are running a a a one a, a very organized planet. If you like, like Earth is the only planet in in this galaxy or this universe that has all these different countries. Everyone thinks they're sovereign. Every other planet you go to, it is a one world government, not the new world order, but it's a one world government, and it's a government that is put together based on competency not people voting someone into power and they are running things for the best interest of their particular planet. And if they're a part of a federation like the Galactic Federation, the Galactic Federation is being run for the benefit of the Federation and its member planets. And they're certainly not running around in tights with phaser guns. This is the human fantasy that, that goes into these books. And you can tell when you get copies of these books, especially the Kindle version, it looks like it was slapped together by some child who didn't even have access to chat GPT. So the, the quality of the material becomes circums <laughs> circumspect. But when you look at The Last Harvest, whether it's the digital or the physical book, you can see this is a top shelf production. It's been typeset professionally. It is uh, 350 or so pages and not double and triple spaced. And it is, there are no spelling errors in the book and it is proper English and grammar throughout. And the cover, The Last Harvest was produced by a professor of fine arts over in Eastern Europe. So every everything about this book, when people pick it up and they read it, they say, this is really a book of substance. And the stuff that would be lumped into the quote unquote speculative category, it all makes sense. Even if someone were to say, well, this was all made up. Well, it all makes sense. It all fits together. It answers all the questions that people always had. So I am not actually getting that sort of pushback that you would expect. I'm getting the opposite where people are saying, wow, finally a book that really summarizes not only what's happening on this planet, but gives the context and the backstory as to why it's happening on this planet and everything kind of makes sense. Will people reject a lot of the book that is in the quote unquote UFO and uh, speculative category? Probably they will, but even those people who might reject that material will not reject the material about FEMA camps. They will not reject the material about wanting to bring the population down from 8 billion to 500 million. That is, is, is not refutable. I could sit here and of course I wouldn't want to bore the audience with quote after quote of who said what and, and, and how many individuals are all standing behind this 500 million number and the year of 2025. But the other material that's in the book, is important because the question always comes up of, well, why do the elite want to take the population down from 800 
800, 8 billion to 500 million. Because that's the question I get on many interview shows where people haven't read the book. They say, but why would the elite do that? And it's a good question. Why would they do it? And the answer is that they're only interested in preserving the individuals on this planet who are RH negative, because if you are RH negative blood, you have a lot of extraterrestrial DNA, and therefore you are a wonderful candidate for hybridization. And why would the Nebu Gray want to hybridize people? It's not just to sell them into intergalactic slavery, because there is an intergalactic slave market out there, but it's because the Nebu Gray would love to take this planet for themselves. And in order to do that, you have to either alter the planet's environment to be adaptable to the alien extraterrestrial genetics, or you have to graft your genetics onto this planet through hybridization. And it's not just the Nebu Gray Empire that wishes to take this planet. The Verdants would love to take this planet for themselves. The Anunnaki would like to take this planet for themselves. There is a whole list of very powerful extraterrestrial groups who could wipe this planet out in less than a day, who would want to take the planet for themselves. And the only thing that's stopping them is that there's another extraterrestrial group, which also has incredible weapons and technology, who wants the planet too. So we have an, a, a veritable Mexican standoff occurring, but you can't see it when you look up at the night sky with your telescope that you bought on eBay, because all of this technology <laughs> is able to cloak these ships so you can't see exactly what's going on. But the problem here that is larger than all of these alien groups wishing to take this planet is the problem of artificial intelligence. And when artificial intelligence gets out of hand, these alien groups no longer want to take the planet for themselves. They all want to compete to who can destroy the planet first before the AI gets off the planet and starts to make trouble on other planets. So it might have started out as a situation where they're all looking at the planet and licking their lips, but now it's they're looking at the planet and they're and bringing their hand closer and closer to the trigger. And this is why The Last Harvest is such a dark book that does not have a happy ending, because it's at the point where there no longer can be a happy ending. And I know that this is something that human beings don't enjoy hearing about because they've been spoiled with all these Hollywood movies where uh, the, the human ragtag band of humans with their slingshots and ARs and some uh, high school physics class are capable of somehow coming up with some solution that would drive an alien species off the planet. There's a technology that's 100 million years more advanced. Now, how does that make any sense? Only to a delusional human mind could something like this be acceptable, but it feels good. You can go to sleep at night after watching that film. The reality is quite so different. When you go to sleep, it's because you're going to be dead. <laughs> I, it's my nervous laugh that, you know, the thing is, and I've always found this with sport. I'm not a sports person, but I've always found this interesting looking at the, I'm a psychology person, but not in the new way of psychology in the old depth kind of old sciences way, you know, back a couple hundred years ago up into you. And one of the things that interests me in watching the sport dynamic is how go team right go team and mm -hmm. how every team feels like it's the best team ever and uh the coach you know the the this the programming that goes on to get the players into the mindset of winning and the deep psychology that goes into that, which is really a lot of propaganda and a lot of programming. And so nations here on the, on, in the realm uh, are the same way, you know, it, when you're in America, you all, all you hear, all, except for all the new foreigners here who hate it, but uh, all you hear is America's got the most advanced everything. We're the best of the best of the best. But then, you know, you hear this in Russia, you hear this in North Korea, you hear this in China. Everyone's saying this. This is a go team kind of thing. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, this idea is interesting to me because wars have uncertain endings. And the way I notice a lot of, cognitive freezing that goes on is everyone really wants to think most people unless they're nihilists want to think that it's going to be all right and and especially when stuff comes through like uh in the old tomes like the bible like well it's it's a short reign and in the end we win but the short reign means most everyone on the field is dead 
like okay so yeah in the end where there's a time factor here and that brings me to this next question why now so the book goes into this but you know i'm sure people are asking this why now there's a whole convergence of astrological stuff that backs this up but timing is a weird thing damien and a lot of people are making their own predictions on time that i see is flawed because they're looking at different systems of time and we can't get on the same board even in the modern world between the lunar calendar and the solar calendar the gregorian ways etc so how come now is it a population thing the thing that uh, of course you just brought up is of course it's an ai thing but can you elaborate well as far as why 2025 it could have been another year but it just so happened that that was the year that the elite and the extraterrestrial forces behind the elite decided that they would be ready to begin this plan at the same time, you have AI being developed, which some people could say is a bit of a wild card. It may not have been expected by those in power, and they probably didn't anticipate that it would develop the way it did and that it would result in the ruin of their plans. But then the, the last harvest brings out a lot of um, new information that certain members of the elite would probably be very interested in knowing. And I'm sure they know, because I'm sure they've all read the book. And that is the idea that the Nebel Gray Empire planned to exterminate the elite as soon as they were done bringing the population down. So the elite, uh, whether it be Freemasons, Illuminati, Bill Gates, all these individuals who are promoting this depopulation, they have this idea that when they're done with it, they're going to be able to enjoy the planet themselves. And no, the Nebu Gray will kill them because that's what they did to Marduk back in ancient times. So they're reading this book now themselves and saying, oh, wait a second, this isn't such a good idea, but what are they going to do? They're, they're uh, doomed as well. And for all of those elite who, who have been exploiting the planet and the people on it and doing what they were doing, there are going to be consequences for them as well. Nobody is necessarily, no one's going to get out of this alive, okay? Uh, and no one have, is going to be escaping judgment, so to speak, because that's really what this book is about. It's, it's, uh, it's coming down to the wire. As far as people wanting to sidetrack themselves with things like football, I, I think there's been... Uh, a lot of evidence lately that people are getting less and less interested in these sort of games. And it's important to remember historically that games such as football were actually the creations of the psychiatrist Edward uh, Bernays, who came up with these uh, institutions like football because he recognized that human beings needed an outlet with which to bleed off a lot of psychic energy that eventually would result in people losing it because they, it was determined by the elite that modern society, the way it was constructed, was going to have deleterious effects on human beings. And they didn't want human beings to suddenly one day revolt and not go to work and not push the plan forward. So they gave them things like football as a, as a safety valve and different civilizations had different methods by which they allowed people to blow off steam. Japan certainly had their ways of doing it that were very different and experimental. And, and there were other cultures that, that had their own ways. But sports is clearly something which many cultures embrace because it's so convenient. But it doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, look, uh, sports are, are games played by children. And they're adopted by adults. And adults get so serious about them as if they actually had some meaning. And anyone who is capable of stepping outside of their normal human programming, such as hybrids and others would look at it and say, hmm, this is kind of, kind of, kind of curious what's going on here. And uh, I think we're getting to a point where people are 
more and more waking up and no longer satisfied with all the distractions around them. Clearly a large percent of the percentage of the population will continue to distract themselves with social media, but more and more people are saying, hey, there's something wrong. And that's another reason why The Last Harvest is so successful as a book because The Last Harvest answers all these questions about what exactly is going on. Unfortunately, a lot of the answers may not be that which people want to hear or make them very comfortable at night, but it is what it is. That's uh, human. I could just say, well, human beings are all going to die sooner or later and usually sooner because their lifespan is only a hundred years. So looked at from a certain perspective, what's really changed. The only difference here is that you're being told in advance when you're going to die. That's something that normally people didn't know. They would just know, well, when I hit the age of between 80 and 100, at some point I'm going to die. So now the the narrative has changed a bit. Well, guess what? By 2020, uh, by 2050, you'll all be dead. And uh, the action really starts to kick off in 2025. And it shouldn't surprise anyone when we have uh, Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons, which is an insane idea. Where, where could that lead? Uh, just to a really terrible outcome. And we see just like World War II was fought on two fronts. We have in um, the Pacific theater now, we have the US sending their military industrial complex representatives over to Taiwan, trying to sell them all kinds of weaponry as if Taiwan is going to somehow be able to fend off the panda bear. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. But the, the idea behind all this is, well, let's proceed with the plan. Let's let's continue on. And a nuclear war is one of these vectors that leads to depopulation. Another would be famine. It's not a, a surprise that the U.S. military had written a report uh, that was titled uh, uh, Controlling the Weather by 2025. What a surprise, 2025 showing up again, in which they talk about technology that will be used to control the weather at will in order to produce droughts and famines at will and to take out nations without actually having to go to war. So the Air Force itself published this, and it's all quoted in the book. The people can go and look up these sources. So we see these various vectors. Uh, viral warfare is a vector. We're all familiar with the pandemic and, and COVID and the vaccine, but that's nothing. There are all sorts of other viral vectors that are in development. The Last Harvest devotes pages and pages and pages to listing the number of scientists and researchers involved in viral warfare that have died under mysterious or very suspicious circumstances. So who's killing off all these scientists who would be capable of coming up with a cure for, let's say, a weaponized Ebola? Well, a lot of these scientists might have very well been involved in the development of weaponized strains of Ebola. So it's time to get rid of them now that they've done their job. So when you read these, these facts in The Last Harvest, they're not the subject of speculation. They're not made up by Lucian. The, one can't help but get very nervous about all these vectors that are, are aiming at, at the destruction of human beings. But in the end, there's nothing you can do about it except... Uh, reach out to the Divine Father at this point. It's as if you, you were placed on death row. Maybe you didn't commit a, a specific crime, but you're on to find yourself on death row and you're not getting off of it. So what are you going to do when you're on death row? Well, what do people usually do? They start to pray. You don't need to be religious to pray. You don't need any religion to reach out to the Divine Father and pray to him and ask him, hey, what's going on? What can I do? And it's uh, so if someone graduates high school, they go see their their guidance counselor, right, about careers. So if uh, you you're find yourself in the situation like in the last harvest, your guidance counselor is a divine father. You should reach out to him. So a lot of people may not be athe they may not believe in the divine father. They might be atheists or or believe that this doesn't exist. And hey, that's their free will if if they want to to make that choice. But the idea is that yeah. the choice has to be presented to them. And the last harvest is presenting to them. Hey, this is what's going on. Now you can use your free will and make a choice. Well, like I said, it's all of it. If if people just want to look at it on the very surface level of this is just a time looking around. Everyone knows something is up. I mean, I think most of the densest people out there know something that it's crazy, that things are off 
and not right, not as they used to be. There's all this other stuff, reason after reason, that it's different. And this isn't a different like it was. This is more extreme than it was in the 60s. And this is everything is different. And everyone's been able to see how the world of warring countries has worked together to lock down things, including Antarctica, including the world with uh, this last I'm coughing when I say pandemic and uh, and space station and all this. They work together for all. Yeah. Well, they work together for all that. And then they uh, give us the drama, the theater of drama. So what I'm saying here is at least it gets people and the idea of coming into the present and reassessing what's important in life and like you said, you, you know, pray to the all father, whatever it is, it's just bringing people into the now. So one of the things I want to throw out here, because we're at 740 already in my time is if anyone has questions out there, please let Jerry know. And Jerry, what do you have so far from you and others? Well, my question, the questions I had, I don't know if you answer or not, but uh, as far as the 2025 timeline, goes how how is that going to go down and did the recent medical intervention that was unleashed on the population have anything to do with it (laughs) medical intervention that's a a funny way to put it well how will it go down it like i've said earlier it's going to go down uh under a myriad of vectors one of them would be Uh, nuclear war, another would be famine and uh, food shortages, another would be viral issues. You can pretty much rest assured that there will be a massive financial catastrophe that will be probably beginning it. So when people talk about banking crises and this sorts of thing right now, you you can rest assured that an economic situation will trigger it off. Right now in China, you have massive unemployment and economic problems over there in that country. And that is a great uh, segue to send people to war because when you can't find jobs for people, you send them into the military to Mm -hmm. fight in wars and get themselves killed. They're no longer uh, an employment issue for you. I think that things will start with a financial catastrophe. And what people don't realize is that the every president that's been in office since Eisenhower upon exiting has signed all sorts of measures into place that we're at a point right now where the United States government can effectively suspend not only the constitution, but take away all your rights just by declaring a state of emergency. So if there is a a financial calamity or if someone detonates a nuclear device in New York City, for example, as their public service campaign would tend to hint at, at that moment, they could declare a martial law, state of emergency, all the FEMA camps can be activated and you literally have no rights anymore, like none. Like they have literally taken away all your rights. It just takes an event to happen where they can declare a state of emergency, martial law, and suddenly there you are with no rights at all. And a lot of people are familiar with Eisenhower signing treaties with the Nebu Gray Empire to allow abductions uh, of people for testing purposes in exchange to get low-grade alien technology from them. But what a lot of people don't know is that he actually made free speech in the USA punishable by death under martial law. So in Article 68 of the Geneva Convention, it says that the US reserves the the right to impose the death penalty in accordance with the provisions of Article 68 without regard to whether the offenses referred to therein are punishable by death under the law of the occupied territory at the time when the occupation begins. So in simple terms, under martial law, during a state of emergency, anyone attempting to exercise their right of free speech under the U.S. Bill of Rights can be put to death. And this is just the beginning. Since Eisenhower, they have written even crazier and more draconian laws, all of which are covered in the last harvest. So there, there is, it's not really a question of how they're going to do it. It's just 
when they're going to do it. And we know the answer to that question because in the last harvest, 2025, it kicks off. Probably could start with a financial catastrophe, a terrorist planting a nuclear bomb. It could be anything. And one thing leads to another. One vector piles on top of another vector. And pretty soon, the internet is completely turned off. We have a state of emergency. And with the internet turned off, how would most Americans survive? Can you imagine if most Americans, their cell phone died and they didn't have internet? They wouldn't <laughs> even know what to do with themselves. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, times. I can't stream HBO. <laughs> what am I going to do? Right. So, uh, so are you, are you thinking this is going to begin in 2025 or culminate then? No, it begins in 2025. Okay, okay. It will culminate by the latest 2050, but probably earlier. Okay. Because things will just accelerate. And AI is that factor that will just accelerate it beyond anyone's yeah. ideas of what would have been. I figured. Okay. Got a question from Oswald. Uh, and this was regarding the earlier vampire discussion. Um, I don't know. Are you informed by Michael Hoffman's Twilight language regarding the cultural t trends he discussed? I could make a joke and say, since we're all going to die, let's talk about vampires. <laughs> enough, of, enough of this darkness. <laughs> let's talk about fantasy, right? And, and, and at a certain level, we, we, can't, uh, we can't fault people that much. And I'm not trying to mock the person who asked the question. I just, I, it's, it gives me a little bit of, chuck, of a chuckle. Uh, I am not familiar, I'll say, with the Twilight Saga. I know what it is. Uh, I never was interested in watching a show about pasty faced teens. Yeah. It certainly makes vampires look very pathetic. Uh, yeah. I, I know people were addicted to this because again, the, the, the shows like Twilight, they're really talking about an archetype that women are attracted to. They say that women are attracted to certain archetypes like the biker, the bad boy, the dark and brooding, taming the the beast, the sort of, you know, uh, how do I say, like uh, romance novel stuff. So in the case of the Twilight Saga, it's about the sulking vampire and how the female tames him. And this really has no bearing on vampirism in any way, shape or form. It's just a fantasy. Yeah, I don't think... That question was about the Twilight Saga. Oh, uh, I don't. Well, he was referencing I something. I think in he's the, the Twilight room. language, isn't yeah. it? I have no yeah. idea what that is. <laughs> this I is don't like know what it is either. <laughs> leave it to Oswald a, to give us a question we never understand. It's a. I believe this is Thank from you, a Oswald. rinse. A rinse guest that yeah. rinse has on has had on. Yeah. Rinse has been obsessed with vampires. I've heard. Uh, well, anyway. maybe there's a reason for that. But anyway, yeah, so the Twilight language, I think, is what Oswald might be referring to. He, yeah, that's exactly what he's referring to. So, sorry, Oswald. No one else has questions. Okay, carry on. They're all hiding. No, everyone's just fascinated and, and can't get <laughs> enough. Well, and the, here's the thing. <clears throat> Pardon me again. The thing is, people... And Damien, you should know this. There's a lot of information in here that hits people later. And uh, when you think about it, and it's when when they see in the book, which is so cheap, I mean, the Kindle's what, $2 or something? It, right. it's, um, it's, it's filled with all this, all the receipts and all this backup information. This is not a fictional piece of work and this is not an op-ed piece either and so I think that's what gives this book a lot of weight as well and 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 that's why when people do later go check it out perhaps or talk to other people that have have listened to it on audio or or read it then more questions start to stream in and a lot of people do want to know these differences about races and stuff. Now see, this touches the whole ufology field. And if I'm correct here, I mean, your Lucian's book was number one in ufology on Amazon. Is it yes. still? Yeah. The, it fluctuates a lot, but it's up there in the, in the, it was number one at one point. It it's in probably the top three or five at this point. 
And, and see, this is why people, people are interested in that aspect of it. And sometimes when you hear you're going to be evicted, you need to hear that information and then process it and get, you know, this is all, I think it's all interesting information, but the thing is you're looking at the processing cognitively of what's being said. And the fact that you don't really dance around is of course a New Yorker thing, but it's also, it's also kind of hard hitting for people. So that's why questions come later. So the ufology part is definitely a major part of this story. And that's why the book has been so successful. And so it does need to be, addressed and i i already addressed my my knee-jerk responses to some of it but at the same time what you're saying in here what what lucian was saying in here and then with all the backup information is stuff i know that's what right. makes this compelling this is why i reached out to you and i wanted you on despite having lost some followers i don't want to say like lost audience members that i would even have you on and uh, and, and, you know, that's their business and not mine. So it's, it's obviously making an impact, Damien. So let's talk about this for a minute. With this information that's coming forward and say, we're looking at a year and a half until really the major dominoes start fall up uh, one domino, the big one starts falling. And all this that we're looking at right now is setting up, has been setting up and, it, everyone that's been in this field of inquiry understands the long legs that social engineering's had through Tavistock and through, you know, what Manly P. Hall was talking about all those years before that. And right. the, you know, Blavatsky and, and then back, you can loop this back. And so if people are not seeing a quickening, then I, I don't even know what to say. I, uh, they're not listening to me for sure. And so the quickening's happening. I see it every day. My little town has changed in the last two years in ways that I don't recognize it anymore. It's not the little town I moved into a decade ago. And it was far enough away from a big town that I thought I was going to be safe from that. It's all in the agenda. It's all been part of these land changes in our society just like roundabouts everywhere which are checkpoints this stuff is not coming out of conjecture it's coming out of source documents and i think this is what gives people a chill when they're dealing with this type of information this is why a lot of people don't like deborah Tavares. she's actually giving you this not her opinion she's giving you source documents the book does that whether you like it or not and you know frankly i don't like it i don't want the i don't i don't want crazy times i don't want i i really just want i'm all about lounging and beauty and leisure and luxury and all that. I'm a tourist. Lay me in my garden. Let me enjoy the dandelions. This bullshit, especially at my age, coming down the pike that I see clearly is not something that's given me, uh, you know, it's not making my tits hard. And so that's the point here. And the thing, the bigger point here is that you're not saying some people are going to be gone. You're saying this is an eviction notice. Everyone is going to be gone. And the people that think going into a FEMA camp is there, you know, that even that is kind of a way out. That's not a way out. You don't want that. And I think that because this is such a hard pill to swallow and the people that live on the sunny side of the street, and there are many, in fact, I believe it's the majority, aren't going to hear this. They don't want to hear it and they'll double down with their manifesting the love and light in their life. I love my life. I love the people around me. I love the world I've created around me. I don't want to lose it, but I actually can look outside of my bubble and see that the pot is almost fucking boiling. That's what I have to say about this, Damien. 
Yeah, I think looking back over the course of my life, I remember when this category that we will loosely define as conspiracy theory literature began. And over the years, this category has grown and grown and grown. It's invaded popular culture. The internet, no doubt, sped it along to the nth degree, where there's so many uh, conspiracies, and some of it is true, some of it isn't. But the takeaway for most people is that it's really ultimately another form of entertainment. If you can't find something exciting to watch on Netflix, well, just go read about the latest conspiracy, whether it's a video on YouTube, a website, or a book. And the the, the one universal factor in all of these theories is that none of them actually have an actual impact on anyone. One can read them and enjoy them, but then be like, eh, whatever, let me go back to my life. And The Last Harvest not only cuts through all the conspiracy, conspiracy theories that are out there in, in terms of what's real and fake and saying, this is in this one book, the complete picture of how it is, almost as if you don't need any other books on conspiracy theories or UFOs to educate yourself this one book tells you everything there is to know. And guess what? You can't just walk away from it unless you're brain dead or an NPC. You just, you, it's almost like being hit in the head with a baseball bat and people read it and say, oh my. And maybe it takes a while for them to process it. Maybe they have trouble reading all through it. Maybe they have a lot of questions. Maybe they react very uh, negatively towards it. But one can't read The Last Harvest and say, oh, that was entertaining. Let me go back to making dinner. No, you read The Last Harvest and you go, wow, we're all going to die and soon. And there's all this other history too, explaining how and why you're going to die and how everything came to be. And even the things that you might want to dismiss as speculative, you're looking at it and saying, yeah, but it all makes a lot of sense. This couldn't all be made up. Right. And and see, like what I keep saying with this point is to I for me, this is get into the present moment and be into the present moment and how this changes your internal vibrational rate. And uh, it, it makes you appreciate the things around you right now. For me, leisure and lounging is setting my ass up on a piece of falling down Victorian furniture and looking out the window. That's leisure and luxury to me. I enjoy every minute of that. And engaging in how I'm going to interact with things as they come. Because if we take this whole narrative away, Damien, we're all going to die. That's just part of it. These 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 vessels we're in aren't made to last forever. And as far as I'm concerned with my own ideas of things, I don't die. And uh, everywhere I go, where I wake up in dreams or anywhere I found myself, I'm still me, whatever that is. And so I think to it's a matter of perspective as far as where we flow our energy into this process. So the fate is we're all going to die no matter what. And there's lots of speculation as to we already have. And this is just kind of a, a, a looping back to get to the cognitive reality that we already did. But that's another subject for another day. So if we can just use this information as an opportunity to actually recalibrate ourselves towards what it is that's important. And, um, and, you know, if, if going to McDonald's every day and doing all that is what you want to do, you know, if you got diagnosed with extreme cancer and the diagnosis is bad, then, you know, you go for it. Uh, so I think that it needs to be something more, where people can find an internal sense of stability, Damien. And I think this is also an idea of how we can have better relationships with people that are present in our lives. I don't waste time on people that don't give me love or show me love. Why would I do that? I spent a lot of my life doing that and it, it 
guess what? It got me nowhere and it wasted a lot of time. Now I love the people that I love and they love me back. And this is a raised vibrational experience for me. This matters. And so that's what I think the blessing of this book is, Damien. I, I know that it's dark for people. It's dark. It's dark material. But we cannot demonize the dark material that, you know, the black Madonna in the church is often a lot of the black Madonnas are actually the patina from the incense and smoke. And that is the wisdom. And I can't recall who I was to, Oh, it was the crimmies on this last chat I did, which will be in the public soon. It's in the private speakeasy. Now this kind of idea of the patina that's built up around you that makes you magical through your experiences, through what you have gone through, through your own gnosis. And I'm talking your own gnosis, not the gurus out there, not anyone telling you else. I, I, what are you? What's happening to you? Who are you? And what is your experience? This is what these times call for, no matter what the narrative is. The Christians are talking about you know, the end times, a, a, a lot of the major religions are talking about the end times. Why is this different for people? Why is what you're saying, not you, but Lucy and Mars presenting in this book different than those narratives? And that's what I find intriguing here, because I, I know a lot of people that can pull up to the end time narratives elsewhere, but this is just too much. Have you any idea, and this is probably the last question unless Jerry has one, but have you seen the hypocrisy in that kind of thinking where a Christian can say, well, we're in end times and then rebuke what you're saying, which is giving them their end times? Oh, oh wow. That's a, that's, that's a, la uh, a landmine uh, issue. I I'll, I'll say this. Yes. Well, at one time, pastors or preachers or whatever you want to call them would talk a lot about the book of revelation. And then they sort of stopped talking about it because people didn't want to hear about it. It didn't pack the pews. It didn't fill the collection plates. And we have instead this Joel Osteen type of modern religious experience here in this country, because that's what people wanted to hear. So of course, is it hypocritical that a, a Christian can talk about uh, the book of Revelation and the end times and then reject this book? Of course, it's hypocritical. And why would they reject this material? Well, in part, because people like to talk about the end times until it involves them. And then the other issue is that the last harvest does point out certain facts that Christians will not be interested in accepting and one of those facts is the is the idea that uh the christians will say well jesus is the only begotten son of god and that's in fact not true that there are many quote unquote only begotten sons of the father uh and many characters that are in religion and mythology are in fact uh they are inspirited by the father and Lucifera was the mother and she has eggs because she was reptilian. And so if a male fertilizes those eggs, the offspring are always female. The only way she gets male offspring is if those eggs are inspirited by the divine father. And that produces a lot of these characters that you read about. And so this idea that, well, Jesus is the only begotten son of the divine father, it's just simply not true. And if you went off this planet out into the rest of the, the, the galaxy or the universe, nobody knows about Jesus or any of this stuff. It's, this is all, it's, they're like, so what? Like, okay, they all know about the father, but they don't know about these other characters. So Again, uh, Christians, they, they like to hold on to their, uh, how should I say, their get out of jail free card, meaning that they have this I idea that because they are saved in quotes, that means that whatever they did in the past, there's no consequences for it. It's all been washed away. And they even go so far, many of them is to think, well, because I am quote unquote saved, I can continue to do whatever I want because then I can just ask for forgiveness. And I believe they call them backsliders is the term the televangelists like to use. And they can just go say, I'm sorry. And it's all going to be okay because you're quote unquote saved. And so 
there is this, uh, there are a lot of issues with these uh, religious vehicles, for lack of a better word. And as I said earlier, all the Abrahamic faiths, whether they be Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, were created by the Anunnaki. So they're not special in the sense that they are directly falling from the heavens, unless you're saying they fell out of a spacecraft owned by the Anunnaki. In that respect, yeah, okay. But again, people need to reach out to the Divine Father outside of those restrictions, because it's preposterous, this idea that you would need a religion in order to, to speak with your creator. It's just, it's just silly ideas that, that people have been entertaining for years, and yeah. and the, Christ, the Christians are no different. So yeah, it's certainly not a book that you'd want to get stocked in a Christian bookstore. Highly unlikely they would stock a book like this, even though you would say they by all rights they should, because it is about the very book of revelation that they're always talking about in great detail here it is so when people talk for example in the in the king james version of the bible it says that the mark of the beast would be inside the hand or inside the head as opposed to on the hand or on the head it's because in the king james version of the bible they saw the future and they know about the idea of implants and chips so the mark of the beast would be implanted inside instead of on top but what are you going to do people are going to want to believe whatever they, they 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 choose to do with their free will i suppose it's a, a lot like the left behind books yes yeah i got one more question and then i'm done because oswald's nagging me bastard <laughs> um, hi oswald out there <laughs> <laughs> he's great i love him we love you i'm just kidding busting your nuts um apparently in the cosmic salon talk you had mentioned that a negative blood type is more special than b negative when b negative is rarer why do you think mm -hmm. that yeah it just is a a statement of fact for the for whoever would benefit from it that when an extraterrestrial looks at a human to hybridize those who are both rh negative as well as a negative would be all other things remaining the same, the most desirable, that would be the ideal, even though a, neg a negative may be more common than let's say B negative or another type, for whatever reason, that is just ideal for them. It doesn't mean though that if you're not A negative that you can't be hybridized, I happen to be B negative, RH negative and B negative, and I've been hybrid, hybridized out the wazoo. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so because as I've said in an earlier uh, interview with Nish, I was part of the Montauk uh, project, and that's where the a lot of the hybridization went on. So, um, I'd love to talk yeah. about that sometime. Sure, and <laughs> so the, and they are individuals, incidentally, who aren't RH negative at all, who still have factors in their dna that leads to them being abducted and hybridized so again i'm not trying to exclude those who aren't rh negative i'm just saying if you're rh negative definitely of interest if you're also a negative you're really of interest but there are cases i have known of others where the individual is not rh negative and they indeed have been very hybridized also i just Thank want to you. say um, Jerry, we definitely need to have Damien back on to dive deep into the Montauk stuff because he's he can he can go there with us. Yeah, and just, of course, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just want to say that so people can hear it here that we will be having Damien on to go into Montauk because everyone's interested in that, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I wrote to Duncan Cameron a couple times and never heard back. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I would love love to deep dive on Mont Montauk's fascinating to me. And the whole idea of the uh, have you ever heard that story about them opening a time loop between sure. sixty three yeah. and eighty three and forty three? That yeah, yeah. They, there's a lot of stories coming out of out of Montauk. That's for sure, and a lot of them are true, or at least have elements of truth to them. Yeah, like Junior. Cool. Right. <laughs> I actually, I actually met um, a lot of my friends were in the Montauk project too, and I actually hung out with Preston Nichols before he died at his house. Mm. 
He lived in Cairo, New York. Very yep. interesting. The, the place yep. would be called Cairo because it's all tied into the ancient places. And he his he had a house that was uh, completely run down, and it was so packed with with old vacuum tube yes. electronic equipment. And he had he had it like in the shed, also outside on the property. It was really a sight to see. And he was a bit of a a bit of a maniac. He had attempted to recreate a, a type of Montauk chair in his house oh wow and he was messing around with it and uh it was it was an interesting experience he's of course he's he's no it's, longer with yeah, us and, it's, it's too uh, bad he was a fascinating guy um i i yeah. saw somewhere on youtube there's like his last interview mm -hmm. where he's actually goes into some depth about vacuum tubes and how he thinks that they are i don't want to mess up what he said but basically the way they work opens up, I, can't, I don't remember now. It's been so long since I listened to it. Basically, it becomes an interdimensional communication device because of the way the waves work in the vacuum tube and all this, and it opens up like a pocket space. Yeah, he was a, he was a, quite a brilliant guy. He had also a lot of other issues, but I, I think in, in defense of 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 him and not that i feel the need to defend him because i know a lot of people have very bad things to say about him i would say that anyone who was involved in projects like the montauk project the, the minds have been fractured so many times there's so many personalities there's so many false memories so many deleted memories that as i point out at another shows unless you are rescued by another alien civilization with equivalent or advanced technology you're pretty much in a lot of trouble and there's no way out uh if, if someone is not rescued it's just it's bad and many individuals who are quote unquote super soldiers or whatever you want mm -hmm. to call them they all kill themselves at a relatively early age because the programming isn't there for them to take take themselves out like that and it, you, you you there's no way that you with your mind could wade through it so who knows in the end what the truth was about what a lot of these individuals like preston nichols may or may not have done what their role was but the other thing i would point out and not to get too much into it now but it, it if someone was involved in in these sort of projects the last thing you want to do is really remember more than you have to because exactly. you will have so many mental <laughs> problems and even alien civilizations that adopt you quote unquote will have a lot of trouble putting you back together while you're still in this vehicle once you're removed from this vehicle on this planet and you're in their civilization they can do all the brain surgery or in quotes to put your mind back together but for now while you're here you don't want to be trying to regret yourself through hypnosis or take ayahuasca to try to access these memories you're just asking for something that you're going to want to hand back the moment you get it yeah that's <laughs> it's like trying to run today's games on a computer from 10 years ago it just doesn't work right 20 years ago well cool well this has been a fascinating discussion we thank you so much for coming on hope to have you back again sometime yes it'd be my pleasure Yes, thank you, Damien. Another tantalizing and polarizing and provocative conversation with you. It's always a pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you. And mm -hmm. as they said in the movie, meet me at Montauk, Eternal Sunshine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very true. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being out there. I'm sure Jerry's been entertaining y'all, but thank you for being I've here. I've been pretty much listening. Um, I'm putting a link to that Preston Nichols interview in chat. If anyone's interested in listening to that, I'll put it here too for you guys. You can grab it. Um, <clears throat> I think it was his last interview before he died. So anyway, thank you, Damien. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll be back in uh, two weeks, I think, seventh, with... Um, Returning guest Nathan Day and Gary Taters are going to talk about some hidden history thing they've, they've discovered. Something new. Something but new. before we leave, though, uh, Damien, yeah. how do people oh, yeah, I'm sorry. find? Yeah. Give us the deets. How do people find the book, etc.? 
is there any way there's probably no way now because lucian's gone so i'm gonna omit that question about autograph copies <laughs> <laughs> unless they want you to autograph it is, did he die or is he just like flip gone off the planet or what yeah went off the planet for real yeah he's not here anymore <laughs> okay so uh i mean people can can interpret that any way they want as as he died he it, it's you know it, we get into a thing where how do you prove it or yeah the point is he's not here to he's not here to talk to anybody about anything but i am so because i was left with the responsibility for bringing this message out there so for those who'd like to get a copy of this book you can find it very easily on amazon by typing in the last harvest by lucy and mars the book cover will jump out at you very quickly uh, another way you could get the book if you were so inclined is you could go to your local Barnes and Nobles and demand that they stock it. Say, I want this book. Can you, can you order it for me? And that way Barnes and Nobles will get the message and start stocking it. Cause it is available on barnesandnoble.com, but it would be nice if they gave it some shelf space because the book is very popular. It's going to be advertised on a digital billboard in Times Square within about a month. And there's a lot of a lot of coverage for this book, so I think if they wanted to get the audio book, they can pretty much get it at any outlet where they would pick up audio books. It's it's being distributed everywhere, and the book's being translated into Spanish and Japanese as we speak. So they should be available shortly for those who wish it in those formats as well. But Amazon is the quickest place to get it. You can also go to the lastharvest.info. And if someone wants to email direct email me directly, they can do so at Damien Dumar, one word at proton.me. But if you go to the lastharvest.info, you can also email me through there. And uh yeah. I'm gonna put that link in chat for everyone. All right, great. Well, thanks again. Hope to talk to you. It was really nice meeting you, and thank you. And I hope Pleasure. To, hope to have you on again, whenever, whenever you want. Always, and... always ready to go on the air. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks, Nish. <laughs> thank you, Damien. Thank you, everyone who tuned in tonight, and thanks, future listeners. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another show. So have a good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>